Good morning everyone, my name is uh, Sebastian Sogamoso, uh, I'm uh, Sebastian in Twitter and GitHub, uh, I come from Medellin, Colombia in South America, uh, I work for a software development company uh, called uh, Wovo Inc, we do, uh, we build uh, custom solutions for uh, um, institutions uh, that are in the higher education uh, business. And today we're, we're going to talk about uh, solid principles uh, through tests. So this doesn't seem to be working. I'll have to do now. Okay, so I'll, I want to start with a question. Uh, can uh, you guys raise your hand if you are doing uh, TDD as as like uh, as a habit on on your daily work? Okay. Okay, that's good. It's more than, than half uh, of you guys. So, so that's great. And I, I've seen that, uh, like, as more and more people adopt TDD as a habit uh, on their day-to-day -day jobs, uh, people uh, have gone to a point where, where, where they're thinking that, like, if they're doing TDD, they're, they, they are doing it right. I mean, and, and that's right. But they're doing it right in the, in the sense that they, their design is good and that their, their applications or their system are well designed just because of the fact they're doing, 2D, they're doing TDD and TDD guarantees that for, for them. But that's not, that's not actually true, or that not, not necessarily true, because uh, as Ken Beck said, uh, TDD doesn't drive good design, it just gives you uh, like immediate feedback of, of what's likely to be back design. So, that's, that, in other words, means that you should listen to your tests. And you should listen to your tests because they're the first uh, client of your system. And if testing is painful, it's because uh, there's a design problem. And uh, like, there's a bunch of ways to make code more testable. And uh, making code more testable doesn't necessarily mean that the code is better. So for example, you could do something like uh, making a private method uh, public just to uh, be able to test the class uh, easier, uh, yeah, in an easier way, but that doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean that your code is actually better. Uh, so in, in a presentation Michael Feathers gave about like the deep uh, synergy between testing and good design, he said that uh, good design makes a class more testable. And that means that solving your design problems will also solve or fix your testing problems. And that's what solid principles are good for. Uh, they are good for helping us uh, write uh, object-oriented uh, software that's well designed. So uh, for the other ones of you that don't know, uh, solid principles is just a set of five principles. They're uh, design level principles. And they were put together by Uncle Bob Martin. And, uh, uh, the, the five principles are the single responsibility, the open close principle, the list of substitution, the interface aggregation, and dependency inversion principles. We'll, we'll get into the, them later. Uh, so the whole idea about, ha about following solid principles is to avoid having code that's uh, rigid, fragile, immobile, and viscous. And this, in other word, words, mean that it helps us ab avoid code, uh, having code that's yeah, um, really coupled that's uh, hard to change, and that's not reusable. Uh, so if we, if, if we look at that in a context of the, uh, of, of the business of uh, software development, basically the intention of uh, solid principles is to help us write code that will help you save time and money. Uh, so to start looking, uh, looking at these principles in, in, in action, let's start by uh, looking at an example. And let's say we have a requirement, right? And our, the requirement uh, tells us to model a shipping method for an e-commerce system. And that shipping method should calculate the cost of shipping a given order. And it should calculate it 
giving on uh, like three things. Uh, the first one is the amount of items in the order to ship, and that's ex excluding the items that are not uh, like sorry that are digital. So for example, if we're talking about books, it should exclude ebooks because we don't ship them I, I, at least not physically, right? So the, the second uh, thing that should be based on is a fixed rate that depends on the amount of items. Uh, and the third one is the distance between the origin and destination. Uh, so we're going to use RSpec uh, to see these examples. Um, so let's start by uh, like, um, modeling a test that helps us implement the requirements we got. So uh, we, we should consider a case when all items are digital, then when only one item is digital, and then when more than one item is digital. And uh, then we should probably add some subcases considering the distance. Uh, so we should consider the case when uh, the origin and destination are in the same state or in the same country or they're in different countries. Then if we wrote the whole test, it will look something like this. I don't expect you, to guys, you guys to read that. I just wanted to show that it's really big, just like for a really simple method. Uh, so it's, it's, that normally it's not a really good sy symptom, but doesn't mean that there's a problem yet. So if, if we have this, this test and then uh, let's, let this test drive us to uh, write some code, the code will probably look like this. And let's look into, into it. So uh, the way we calculate the cost is just uh, like a really simple formula. It's items times rate times distance. And let's see where, like what's each one of these three things. Uh, so items, uh, Items are coming from, from the order, and we are getting the items from the order, and then just uh, like rejecting the, word, the ones that are digital, and just counting them. Um, so if we look at this, it seems like uh, the shipping method class actually needs to know a lot about order, and how to get the items that, that are going to be shipped from the order. And this is normally not a good symptom, but let's keep on looking at this, this code. And then the, the way we calculate the rate is a really simple, sim simple method. Just checks uh, if, if uh, we have more than one item and it applies a rate. If we have uh, less than one item, we're going to apply another one. And although this is quite simple, uh, it seems like this is something that uh, the shipping method class shouldn't probably know about uh, because if, if, if this changes, uh, the shipping method class will probably need to change. Uh, same, with, same thing with the distance. So we're just returning an, an integer based on if the, if the origin and destination are in the same state or in the same country or they're just in different countries. Um, so uh, uh, looking at, at a class like this, uh, which has like a bunch of private methods which actually have the information or the business logic we're trying to model. Uh, normally, it's normally called, I mean, this type of class, sorry, it's normal, there are normally cla called uh, iceberg classes. Uh, and what that means is that the class has a, although on the surface it looks like it has a, a small public API, which is simple and narrow, uh, if, you, if you open it, you'll notice that it has a lot of private methods and the logic uh, that's relevant to the class or, or to the business or to the system we're, we'll build, we are building, it's all on those private methods. Uh, you should actually try to avoid this. It's, it's not something you want to have in your system. OK. so. Uh, let's look at the single responsibility principle, which will probably help us uh, design this code better. And uh, the single responsibility principle basically says that a class should have one and only one reason to change. Uh, so looking at, at, what, at the class we, we just have, which has a bunch of private methods, and looking at this principle, which says it has a, a class should only have one and, one and only one reason to change, we could easily think about extracting a class from the class we have. And that's probably a good idea. But instead of jumping to, to conclusions and to solutions, let's let the test tell us what to do. So let's do something I like to call wishful testing, which means that uh, we are, we're, going, we're going to write tests that assume that 
code that's not already part of our system exists. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna write code that assumes that uh, the call we would like to exist is already there. Okay, so test will probably look like this, a, a, a lot shorter than the one we originally had. And let's look at it in the, into more detail. So this is the first uh, part of the test, or the, or the first test, which basically uh, considers the case when we have all items digital on the order and issue returns zero. And let's look at a, a specific line here, in, which is this one. So we're getting an order and we're stuffing a method called non-digital items and telling it to return zero. So this, this method uh, doesn't exist or doesn't probably exist yet, but it makes more sense for us to, to expect that method to exist because we shouldn't, like, we shouldn't let the shipping method class know too much about, how, uh, about the order and how to get the items from it. So this makes more sense. We're delegating the responsibility to the order or order object, or object, uh, sorry, or order class. So now let's look at the second part of this test, the second example, and let's look at some specific lines of that. Uh, the the first line I, I would like us to look at is this one. Uh, so we are assuming that there's a class called shipping rate, which is going to be in charge of calculating the rate we're going to use to calculate the cost of the shipping, of shipping a, a, an order, and. Uh, this is also the same thing. Uh, we're also like uh, doing wishful programming, uh, wishing that this class existed and that this class contained all the logic to calculate the rate we need, we, we need to use. Same for distance. And we're, we're again, we're expecting the order to have this non-digital items method. Um, so after writing this test, this will probably lead us or drive us to writing, uh, creating a class that looks like this. So. Uh, let's look at it with more detail. So uh, the, the way we calculate the cost is basically the same, same formula. And then uh, the way we get the items changes a lot. We don't have to know a lot about the order. We're just calling a method on it. Uh, uh, same thing with the rate. We're just depending on the rate, on the shipping rate class and distance. We're doing the same thing. So what we basically did here is we extracted uh, some responsibilities that the shipping method class had and, uh, and we delegated them to other classes, which uh, makes more sense and which leaves our, our shipping method class, uh, uh, makes it more simple. And the good thing about this is that if the way we uh, calculate the shipping distance, uh, sorry, the distance uh, from one city to the, from the origin to the destination, we should only change the shipping uh, distance class and we don't have to change the shipping method class. Uh, and What's also good about this is that we can probably reuse this uh, shipping distance and shipping rate classes. So uh, that's how uh, writing tests a bit differently will help us follow this single responsibility principle. Uh, now let's look at a different principle, one that's called the list of substitution. And this principle basically says that uh, the right class must be substitutable for its, their, its bare base class. So in other words, this means that if we have a cl class A and class B, and we have an inst uh, and, and class B is a subtype of class A, we should be able to replace an instance of class A with class B and the system shouldn't break. Um, and, and, and like this principle, it's, it's really based on, on, uh, on how we should be uh, like, take care of this when we're using inheritance, but this actually can be used like in a more general context. Uh, and I'll talk, uh, I'll mention what that is. So in Ruby, uh, that means that uh, if it looks like a dock, and if it quacks like a dock, or sorry, seems, or streams like a dock, then it's probably a dock. Uh, and we call that, uh, sorry, and we call that dock typing. Uh, so let's look at an example with some tests. So we already know the shipping, uh, the, the like a shipping method that's called standard method, the one we just saw in the past example. And now on the right, uh, we have a new method that we want to introduce to our system called express me shipping method. So uh, if just by looking at, at the name of the, of the methods we're testing on, on those classes, they look pretty similar, although it's easy to see that uh, the express method it's mi is missing a, a, a method that the uh, standard shipping method has. And that means that we couldn't 
con like replace confidently one class with the other. We, we couldn't replace like the standard method with the express method because uh, it doesn't respond to the packing days uh, message, so the, the system could break. It will be like doing something like this. Uh, so if we, if we, since we're talking about tests, there's type of tests that can help us pre like uh, do this confidently and prevent us from having this type of problem, and they're called contract tests. Uh, and basically what a contract test is, is a test that, will allow us, that allows us to verify that a given class follows a given contract. Uh, and since we're using our spec, our spec uh, uh, has like this uh, really uh, nice method called uh, share examples, uh, which allows us to define a set of tests in, in the block and then we use it. So now, like on, on this, in, in this particular case, we're just uh, checking that the class, the given class responds to some methods. We can even uh, specify which uh, parameters to receive. Uh, and then if we go to back to the test, we're we can just add them to uh, the test of the uh, standard shipping method and express shipping method. And we, it, we just do it by using it should behave like and then calling the name of the block. Um, so this will allow us to notice that when we run the test that the express method doesn't follow the contract. And then we could easily uh, add that method to the, to the class. And now we can be sure that we are uh, like, we, we can do duct typing safely with confidence and the system won't break. Um, so now let's say we got a new requirement. Uh, and the requirement says that we need to be able to ship an order uh, using any of the existing shipping methods. So we have, let's say we have, the system has grown and we have three shipping methods now. We have the standard, the express, we, we, which we just saw, and one new one called same day shipping uh, method. So if we start by writing the test, uh, this will probably be the cases we will need to consider. Uh, we will need to consider when the, when the shipping method is uh, the standard one or the express one or the same day method uh, one. Uh, so if we let this test drive the, the design of our classes or the, the code we should write, uh, it could end up looking like something like this. Uh, let's look into more detail. So it seems like what we're doing is we're just checking which is the class or the type of the method. And this normally is not a good idea, as you, most of you probably know. Uh, so we're just uh, checking if it's a regular shipping method and acting accordingly. Same thing with express method and same thing with same day method. So uh, what if a new shipping method was introduced? And would that mean that the order class should change? Well, if we look at the current implementation, that means yes. We'll probably need to add a piece of code when we checked if the, where we checked if the, if the shipping method is the next day shipping method and act accordingly too. Uh, so now let's use some of the solid principles to make that better and to allow us to write tests that will allow us, that, that will guide us to write better code. So let's talk about two more uh, principles. Uh, one's called the dependency inversion principle, which says that you should depend on abstractions, not on concretions. And another one's called uh, the open close principle, which says that uh, you should be able to uh, extend a class without opening it or without modifying it. Um, so if we look at this code, we, we just saw that to, to add a new shipping method, we had to change the class. Basically, that means opening it. So uh, Uncle Bob will probably tell us, told, tell us to close that class. And let's see how we can do that. Let's, and let's start by, by the test. Um, this is how the test will probably look like. Uh, we're just uh, creating an instance of the order and then calling the ship method on it, passing the method to it. And then we're, what we're going to check is that uh, the ship method or the ship message is actually sent to that, uh, to that object uh, with, with some uh, arguments. So that will probably lead us to write code that looks like this. Looks much more simple, right? Uh, the ship method just receives the method and calls the ship. Uh, and, and send the ship message to it with some arguments. Uh, and that means that now what we achieved here is that uh, we are not depending on concretions, which 
and, and in other words, for this example, that means we don't depend on concrete shipping methods and their implementation. Uh, we can just pass any shipping method to it, and the, uh, and the order class should know what to do with it. And also, uh, we don't need to open this class. Anytime a new shipping method exists, we can just uh, send it to it, and we can, and that's what we call extending a class with, without opening it. Uh, so the, we could say that the class is closed, but still awesome. Okay. Now let's talk now about uh, next uh, solid principle, which is called uh, interface segregation. Uh, so this principle was is, is actually pretty interesting because it was written uh, with languages such as uh, Java and C++ probably in mind. Uh, it doesn't really uh, apply to Ruby as 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 its, de its definition um, because it says that we should make fine great interfaces for client or that are specific for each client. And as you know, in Ruby we don't have interfaces, but uh, there's there's like an implicit message in this principle that we can actually apply in Ruby and that we should care about. And it's about the, the public interface of the classes we write and how they should be small. So let's say uh, we want to see which are the uh, instance method, the public instance methods of a uh, factory record base, for example. And factory record base has actually uh, a lot, it has uh, 123. Uh, public instance methods, which means it has a huge interface. So if we wanted to uh, build an object that acts as, a, as an active record based instance, uh, let's say we could uh, create a, a contract test, uh, a, a, as we just saw before, and this will mean we will have to write a big contract test, and that's not something we will want to do, right? Uh, that's probably a uh, pain to maintain. So uh, that's why we should aim to uh, build classes that have small public interface, such as the standard shipping method, which basically just have uh, four private, sorry, four public method, instance methods, which is, means that it has narrow, in, narrow interface, which means that if we want to build a class that acts as a uh, shipping method, uh, we will just need to write a small contract test, which is easier to maintain, and the and the and and like the, the resulting class we build the, the resulting shipping method will, will probably be a simple class too. So, uh, why is all of this important? Like, why should we care about uh, solid principles, and why should we uh, consider solid principles where, when writing tests? Well, this is because solid principles allows us to manage our dependencies uh, so that we have code that's less coupled and more cohesive. And that means that our code will be easier to maintain. Uh, and if we have code that's easier to maintain, we'll probably be happier developers. Uh, so one thing that's important to know uh, is that solid principles are not the holy grail. It doesn't mean that you should like apply them blindly and you should always apply them. And it's, it's not like a golden rule you should always follow. Uh, I've seen cases where, where people take this like, to an extreme uh, when, where they uh, actually uh, end up writing code that's worse uh, than what they had before just to follow these principles blindly. Uh, so apply them when it makes sense to you. Uh, and uh, uh, the last thing I would like to say to you guys is at, it's bringing up this uh, quote by Ken Beck. Yeah, I like quotes by Ken Beck. He has some great quotes. And this one says that uh, He's not, he's not uh, like uh, a great programmer, he's just a good programmer with great habits. And I think that's really important. And that's something uh, we should all consider. Like having great habits or acquiring great habits will actually help us like constantly, deli constantly deliver great code. And uh, personally, I think that that's what solid principles are good for. And Solid principles, like following solid principles and knowing solid principles and keeping them in mind when writing tests and when writing code will help us acquire good object design habits. Um, so thank you, that's all I have. Okay, I think we 
have some time for questions. I'm, I'm just curious if you've seen uh, any great examples of kind of wrapping active record uh, so that like apps can kind of, you know, maybe Rails apps or other kind of apps can access the database through a layer that has a smaller number of methods. And if that's something that like people have started doing just because it's hard to write clean, like good tests with just like active record. Because like all our active record stuff is basically integration integrated against the database. Um, and that makes our tests slow and clunky and weirdly coupled and all that kind of stuff after a while. So just curious if you've seen any really good patterns there. Yeah, that's, that's actually a very good question. So uh, what I, I've been doing, I, and I've seen a lot of people doing is uh, like maintaining your active record classes or like your models basically in a REST application as, as, as small as you can. And that means like only using active record to uh, to do stuff related to the database. Like you can you can just have uh, scopes there, uh, validations, and like maybe callbacks if you want to, to use those. And, and and that's it. Like if you like if you have to uh, write some business logic that, uh, that relies on, on that data being saved to a database, uh, you should do that on, on different objects. And uh, that's that makes your code uh, way easier to maintain your uh, active record uh, classes uh, small and, and easy to use too, and also will help you like have a test suite that runs faster probably.